All right, we're rolling. We're okay. Rinpoche, what is the significance of Buddhist life release? Why is it done? So, what we call life release is uh, maybe similar to what some people may say pardoning someone who is condemned to death. Uh, the basic idea is there are animals who have been captured and who are going to be slaughtered and to buy from their owner these animals so that they may be able to live their life through through without being harmed uh, so that's what we call life release and this is, is essentially done out of compassion simply uh, these animals just like us uh, fear pain fear suffering they don't want to be killed they want to live and we try to use our resources to uh, save these animals why are lobsters a good choice for release? So there's not, I mean, there's not particularly a reason to choose one animal over another species. We, all animals, whatever their species uh, have in common that they uh, suffer, and they are sentient beings, they experience pain. Uh, some animals, unfortunately, are killed in atrocious uh, conditions, and that is the case, uh, for example, of lobsters who are actually boiled alive, and that is uh, very painful. And so uh, we try to also save them, and uh, here in Martha's Vineyard in particular, a lot of uh, lobsters are, are boiled alive every year. Uh, many thousands of them so we try to buy a few and uh, let them uh, be free free of being boiled alive and hopefully being able to live live uh, their life in peace in the ocean what are the possible benefits in the local community that could come out of a discussion around the lobster release so the reason why we uh, release lobsters, as I explained, is just out of compassion. But it is believed that uh, by engaging in such acts of compassion, those who engage in it uh, will uh, gain, uh, will make progress themselves. They, they will, by generating their compassion, they will develop their own uh, good potential they will develop wholesome qualities and these have uh, consequences in defining their character and particularly also defining a person's future so if you save lives uh, and protect life uh, one of the consequences is you will also gain happiness and a longer life and good health for yourself of course we don't engage in those actions on a on the basis of a selfish motive, trying to do something for ourselves. We're really trying to do that purely out of compassion. But there are these uh, benefits that will come. It's not something that only benefits the animal. It also benefits uh, the person who engages in acts of kindness. How could Buddhists use a mantra such as Omane Pemehun or other mantras to respond in the moment in the presence of a suffering or dead animal? So, uh, if we save an animal, we uh, release it uh, back into the wild where it can live, um, <clears throat> provided that it has all the uh, conditions, that's the best thing we can do for them, for this life, for their present life. But we also try to benefit them even further and animals, unfortunately, uh, don't have the capacity necessarily to understand or to discern between what is a wholesome state of mind, what is an unwholesome state of mind. Uh, nevertheless, they have senses. They hear, they smell, they feel. So we try to leave some kind of imprints of um, words uh, or objects that represent 
uh, wholesome qualities. And uh, in, in Buddhism, in particular in the Vajrayana tradition, we emphasize the use of what is termed a mantra, which is uh, uh, kind of a very condensed word that contains the essence of all the teachings. And it's also associated with uh, a Buddha and, or Bodhisattvas who have uh, themselves cultivated great wholesome qualities and have dedicated their life and action for the welfare of others and all the merit that they have gained through those actions they have dedicated it to the, the mantra to whomever hears this mantra they will also uh, share the merit of these bodhisattvas so that's the reason why we receive we recite these ma mantras we believe that if animals hear these mantras they will uh, receive some of the merit and blessing of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and through that they will create a connection that will ultimately lead to their uh, awakening so rather than just helping them uh, temporarily it is a way of also helping them uh, ultimately towards what is their ultimate benefit of attaining the state of Buddha and so uh, for instance there are many mantras but among all the mantras uh, one of the most powerful mantras is the mantra associated with uh, Avalokiteshvara who is the embodiment of loving kindness and compassion of all the Buddhas and his mantra is Om Mani Padme Hum and so this mantra means simply uh, lotus and jewel uh, it's the, the name of Avalokiteshvara, one of the names of Avalokiteshvara. And these two words, lotus and, and jewel, signify, the lotus signifies wisdom, and the jewel, uh, the universal loving kindness and compassion, uh, as represented in, uh, in Buddhist literature as bodhicitta. So this, <coughs> these two qualities combined is... Uh, the actualization of the uh, true innate qualities of the mind and uh, leads to actual true freedom and true genuine peace, uh, freedom from uh, suffering and dissatisfaction which are inherent in any conditioned existence. So uh, this is a very powerful mantra both in its meaning and also in the blessing that it contains, so we recite that. There was a moment where the low power mode came oh, on and yeah. it might have stopped the video, okay. so... We'll see. Yeah, do you want to maybe do it once again? I mean, uh, uh, Daniel could probably edit it out, oh, okay, okay. but just in case. All right. So, this question, how can Buddhists use the mantra, such as Om Mani Padme Hum? So the we can use the mantra Om Mani Padme Hum, which is the mantra of the Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara. Um, the mantra uh, we simply just recite it. Uh, if we know uh, how to practice and med meditate, if we know the, uh, the different um, um, meditations that are taught with the mantra, we can also practice those. If not, just simply reciting the mantra, the words itself, can be of great benefit. It is a way of uh, sharing the merit of these great bodhisattvas with the beings who hear this mantra. So when we come across, it's not just when we are uh, practicing life release, but also when we come across uh, animals that are on our path, that we meet, it can be pets, it can be animals that are dying that we see or who are injured or not even that we just come across in general. Uh, if we can recite those, recite the, that mantra, Om Mani Padme Hum, or other mantras as well that are, are taught, but Om Mani Padme Hum is one of the most powerful and easily uh, easy for us to retain. Uh, so to recite that mantra will be of great benefit for, the, for those beings and as well sustain for a practitioner his own practice. How could a non-Buddhist relate 
to Omani Penehon for use with suffering animals specifically? Uh, so, uh, the idea is if you are a Buddhist, uh, a Buddhist practitioner, and you are familiar with uh, uh, Vajrayana uh, Buddhism and the use of mantras, of course, the practice of mantras uh, will come to you uh, naturally, uh, if you, particularly if you've received some teachings from it. But the question is, if you are not a Buddhist, can you still recite those mantras? Of course, there's nothing that, uh, particularly the mantra of Avalokiteshvara, uh, whether you're a Buddhist or not, whether even if you believe in the power of those mantras or not, just simply uh, reciting those mantras out of genuine compassion because you want that being to be free of suffering. Uh, you're moved by compassion and you want to help him and then sometimes there's really nothing much we can do uh, but uh, wish and pray for them so it is said that if they hear this mantra they will gain great benefit so if you can recite it uh, it will be beneficial for you who is reciting it and also for that animal you will receive the benefit of it regardless of if you believe in it or not Thank you, Rinpoche.